So welcome to the 145 Cyber War and Peace talk uh, today given by Chris Sumner. Uh, Chris started his career back in the dark ages of 1999 uh, doing security management for um, a Fortune 100 company. Uh, moved from there, um, Chris began to work personally on data visualization and as you'll soon hear, actually has an interesting story about Tony Hawk, so uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, today he'll be talking about using data visualization tools in social networks. So please join me in welcoming Chris Sumner. Thanks uh, very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Just want to make sure before I get started because I'm using this mic thing here that lets me walk around. All right, we're good. All right, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Chris Sumner. Um, I started my career a little longer ago than uh, 1999, but uh, got into security uh, full-time around then. So, uh, first of all, thanks for coming today. There's uh, another talk about ATMs, and uh, so I'm pretty stoked that we've got such a, a big audience, actually. Thanks very much. Um, so, my talk today is on uh, social networking um, and data visualization and uh, extending data visualization tools to... Um, enumerate social networks uh, maybe a little bit quicker than, um, than by hand or uh, in a non-visual way. Um, before I start, I've got a, um, a disclaimer that I need to, uh, to share. I'm speaking for myself, not as part of my company, so if anybody knows who I work for, then uh, it's important to at least let you know that uh, this is you know, on behalf of me, doesn't reflect the opinions of my, uh, the organization for, for which I work. Um, so, okay, so what are you in for uh, today? Um, first of all, we're going to start with a brief introduction to uh, social network analysis um, and a brief intro to visualization, about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll go pretty quick. There's uh, a white paper uh, with a lot of the science behind it uh, available. Um, then going to take a look at uh, a case study with uh, Twitter and a tool called Maltigo. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a case study uh, that's a, a little bit darker involving uh, Nigerian 419 crime uh, versus Maltigo. Um, so the goals of the talk today really, um, I guess firstly, it's to, uh, to share what I've, been, uh, what I've been doing at a high level and give you some appreciation of the possibilities of uh, data visualization in this kind of field. So um, hoping that some of you will go, oh, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty neat. I can apply this in slightly different contexts, um, you know, and maybe encourages folks to go and explore uh, a lot of the data that's out there um, so that, you know, you can apply it either in a, a work situation or for, you know, analyzing networks yourself. So, uh, who's the talk aimed at? I just want to be clear on this in case people are, you know, coming who've already got, you know, a significant level of data visualization knowledge um, or a significant level of uh, social networking data mining knowledge. So, um, really, if you fit into this uh, category, um, you should be in for a good time. Um, I can't promise that, but see me afterwards if, if it wasn't. Um, if you fit into the, the next category here where you're either, um, you know, really, uh, really experienced or you've had some good experience with data visualization or with um, social networking analysis, then you may get some, some crossover and see how you can use different techniques in a uh, kind of different way. And if you fit into the, uh, to the latter category, um, you probably get what I'm talking about already. But there may still, still be something uh, you know, in it for you. So that's really what the, you know, who the talk's uh, aimed at. So briefly, who am I? Um, I'm, obviously, I'm Chris Sumner, but I, I signed up to uh, Twitter uh, last uh, summer. And like a lot of people who sign up to Twitter, the name that you want has already been taken by somebody else. So I ended up choosing the Sugmeister because my, my nickname at school and forever since has been Suggy. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that I sort of kind of regret now, um, and, you know, never mind. So, uh, by day, uh, I work in uh, corporate, uh, corporate security, uh, actually do program management around security uh, development lifecycle, and uh, outside of work, uh, I'm interested in uh, data analysis, not usually social networks, but um, looking at uh, large data sets, 
um, visualizing that uh, to help me understand a little bit more about the data at a high level before drilling down. And uh, since last year, really got into social media in a pretty big way, and also a DEF CON chapter called DC4420 in London. Um, a quick note, if you're, you know, if you've not been to a local DEF CON chapter, really worth going. Um, it's like bite-sized bits of DEF CON throughout the year, so you, you know, you don't get that post-DEF CON uh, depression thing going on, um, if you get that like I do. Um, and a strange sequence of events led me to appearing here, so I, I, you'll obviously see why uh, shortly. Um, so, okay, the introduction piece, social network analysis, a target-rich environment is either a problem or an opportunity, uh, depending on um, which side of the you know, table you, you're, you're looking at it from. Social network analysis has been around really since, uh, since the Greeks, but this guy here, uh, Jacob Marino, uh, was pretty widely credited um, as being sort of the, the originator of this diagram, which you'll be uh, pretty familiar with by the, uh, by the end of the talk, this kind of thing. So um, that was published first in the New York Times in 1933, and uh, really he sort of led the field in understanding the dynamics of uh, social networks. So um, a little bit more about that in the white paper. Um, and then a target-rich environment. This was something that I kind of figured would be the case, but had never actually uh, looked into until I decided to, you know, submit a, a paper for the talk. Um, I read a report that was out this year or late last year uh, by Cisco stating that there was something like 21 exabytes of data flowing around the world per month. Um, and the amount of data that's available now that's sort of personal information, photographs and stuff is just like exploding. Um, so you're getting more and more data out there from uh, more and more people, which is uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty interesting if you like exploring data. Um, I should probably get out more. But, um, so Facebook um, recently, actually if you look at the white paper, it says 350 million users, and then before I got here it said it's you know, hitting 500-ish million users. Of course, you know, some people may have more than one account, although that's you know, sort of forbidden, but you know, such is life. Um, then there's something else interesting. There's a, a bunch of uh, studies that have been going on. Um, Stanford have done quite a lot on this, looking at what people say and actually what people do. So I kind of termed this the, the privacy uh, paradox. Um, and it's where the students interviewed mostly said, yeah, I take privacy very seriously. Um, yet when you know, they analyzed the behavior of these students on uh, social networks like Facebook, they did the opposite of what they said they want to do. So, for example, 89% uh, used, uh, used their real name, 60, what was it, 61% have uh, an identifiable uh, photo online, and so on. Um, I mean, recently, uh, you know, a lot of the, the privacy concerns are around Facebook. A lot of people are still what I'd term promiscuous. Um, you know, they'll be friends with anyone, they'll post anything up there. Um, I mean, it's a, a data miner's dream, uh, actually, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's some seriously cool stuff going on in this space. Um, and then finally, so my personal favorite, really, uh, there's a great paper. It's a pretty, uh, pretty big paper by a guy called Daniel Solov and, uh, called, uh, you know, I've Got Nothing to Hide and other misunderstandings of privacy. And that kind of goes along with the, the whole privacy paradox of people putting more and more uh, stuff out there. So we've got social network analysis, um, and now we've got a target-rich environment. So previously, you know, when, when the Greeks were looking at this sort of stuff, um, you know, it was all by hand. And now, obviously, you've got a, a, a stack, a great stack of data uh, available that you can explore very, very quickly, as we'll see, a, you know, a little bit later. Um, so what's the problem? Well, um, your searches, your online activity isn't all that, an, you know, anonymous, essentially. Um, and that's probably not a great surprise to anyone in the room. Uh, but, you know, the, there was uh, the case of uh, this lady, um, Thelma Arnold. I won't read the AOL number, but... Um, in a roughly 2006, AOL published a you know a bunch of their sort of search uh, strings, and uh, I think it was again it was the New York Times. They must be into social analysis, 
Um, they'd actually gone taking a look at the data for this AOL user 4417, what have you, and they determined that it was this lady in Georgia, this uh, Thelma Arnold, because of the searches that she was looking at, because you know she was looking at uh, dog kennels and stuff like that. For you know, you can see she, she's got a dog. So all of this stuff that's out there, this I've got nothing to hide. What could possibly go wrong? Isn't all that uh, anonymous, even if the data is uh, anonymized and your real name's taken out, it's still highly possible for people to link that back to, a, to an individual. So we've got a lot of data um, and you've got uh, a lot of noise. Um, really the opportunity here is how do you find the interesting stuff just a little bit quicker um, and you can do that as I hope to show uh, today quickly is by you know, data mining, techniques like screen scraping. I don't know if anyone saw the Michael Schrenk uh, talk at uh, DEF CON last year. If you didn't, go onto the, the archives and have a look at that because that's an absolutely fantastic talk um, around uh, you know obtaining data through screen scraping. Obviously, you've got to be aware of the robots.txt and what have you. Named entity recognition and data uh, visualization. I'll talk just briefly about those two uh, right now. So, named entity recognition is really parsing data to uh, extract and classify information. It differs from uh, sort of meta analysis because it classifies the, the you know the, the data and not one particular type. Very similar, but uh, slight you know sl slight difference. So, here's an example. Um, Greg bought 300,000 shares of Legat. Completely random I idea here. Uh, in 2010, and this is what it ends up um, looking like. Um, this is kind of a, um, the, the example was pretty much from Wikipedia, but now what you can see here is that you've almost got sort of an XML uh, format where it's picked out the name, uh, a quantity, uh, an organization, and, and, uh, and a date. So at a very high level, that's what it's like. You know, have a, a Google around for named entity recognition. You'll see a lot of stuff from uh, the University of Stanford and the University of Illinois, and there's some online uh, online tools, uh, Open Calais, for example, um, that's got an API, so you can pass data to that and uh, you know and use it. So we'll see a little bit more about the power of what you can do here. Um, data visualization. Um, quick show of hands: anybody read this book or familiar with um, a tool called piece of software called Processing? Well, a couple of people, maybe. Um, Processing, it. I mean, first of all, this book is, is fantastic. Ben Fry really has done a, a great job um, and outlines a process for data visualization, acquiring data, parsing it, filtering it, essentially getting your data into the, to, uh, a neat filtered form and then rendering it and then allowing you to interact with that model. Um, so almost a three-step process, get the data, tidy it up, um, output it to some sort of file or you know XML, CSV, whatever, um, and then render it. So uh, iterative. Um, and he talks about that in this book and uses the, the processing software, which you can download, have a play with. It really is fantastic. Uh, but it's this last point really that I wanted to home in on, which is where you see a big gap in uh, a number of tools out there is interacting with the data. So the whole process of generating a data set. Um, and then interacting with the data and, and doing, you know, doing that in a sort of a, a, a loop um, means that you have to leave the graphical user interface. Whereas what I'm going to talk about today shows you a tool where you don't leave the, don't necessarily leave the the, the GUI. So for tools, there's a number of them. Um, I just put a few on here. I could, you know, you could go on. There's a great uh, website out there called secviz.org. Um, it's got a whole bunch of, uh, of tools uh, on there. Um, I picked a few that I, I liked and have played around with, but going to focus on Multigo. Um, so the first question really is, well, what, you know, what, uh, what is Multigo? So I'm going to go through this bit pretty quickly because I'm going to talk about it and you'll get the idea through the, the rest of the talk. But briefly, uh, it's a tool for you know, information gathering and seeing, visualizing uh, information um, in a, a graphical, uh, graphical way. There's uh, infrastructure uh, components and I'll show a quick example of that. So you can look at uh, DNS records, IP addresses, URLs, 
uh, mail records, what have you. And there's a, a human part where you can look for uh, mentions of, uh, of people, telephone numbers, and uh, you know, what have you, and link all of those sorts of relationships together. I'll show you more about that, but it, this is just a, a quick snapshot. Um, but the most exciting thing uh, about Multigo is that it's extendable by design. So whatever you get out of it, just quick show of hands, actually. Who's used Multigo? I mean, you will get this then, right? Um, no, uh, so it's, it's extendable by, by design. So you can write your own uh, what are called local transforms uh, to go and um, do whatever it is you want. Um, I'll talk more about that and show you what I did uh, in, our, uh, in our case study. So if you haven't used Multigo, here's where you go and get it, uh, perturva.com, written by uh, a couple of guys uh, in South Africa, Roloff uh, and uh, Andy Mohawk, great guys actually, been a, a very great help to me. And if you didn't know, uh, there's a 25% discount during this sort of conference week uh, if you type in the coupon code Black Hat at, uh, at Multigo. There's a community edition which is kind of scaled down, uh, but it'll let you have a play around with it. And there's also a, um, a full client version, which is usually about $430. Um, so 25% off. So this is what the first screen is you, you're going to you know, see uh, when, you, when you sort of fire it up, once you've got your license key in and, and, uh, and all of that. So completely, um, this, is, this is kind of what, you, what you'd see. So pick a, a domain. I know that the text is going to be small. That's not really... Uh, that important, but I picked out uh, six domains completely at random. So I went for you know legat.com, um, hightechhustler.com, uh, securitygeek.com. But you can see it. What I wanted to do was briefly demonstrate what the tool allows you to do. So I figured it'd be neat to see out of these domains, you know, who's sharing uh, MX records. Um, so you can see this. I've got Security Geek down uh, at the bottom. Uh, which is my uh, website, and then you've got uh, a number of these other entities all sharing the same uh, MX records uh, from, from GoDaddy. Well, you can explore a little bit further, and actually last night I was playing around with this looking at, um, say, the, uh, the websites that are associated with those addresses, and then looking at the um, email addresses that were found on those websites, and then looking at the email addresses on those websites that appeared on other websites, and you could see um, interesting um, relationship because a lot of the email addresses listed on all of those sites also appeared on uh, attrition.org. So if you knew nothing about uh, you know, what's been going on, um, at least on Twitter, with regards to discussion around uh, Legat, um, you'd have spotted that, uh, that relationship pretty, pretty quickly. So moving, I guess, neatly on to, uh, to, to Twitter, I mentioned it, I sort of joined Twitter about, uh, about uh, a year ago. Um, started following two people uh, initially. One was uh, Ryan Russell. Um, he's a pretty uh, interesting guy. And uh, another chap was, um, was uh, this guy here, Tony Hawk, um, a US skateboarder. Um, so... What Tony likes to do, uh, I didn't follow him for this reason, I found that out while I was following him on Twitter. He, he likes to get uh, skateboards that look a little bit like, like this, uh, with his sort of signature on it, that hopefully uh, one of you is going to take away uh, today. He likes to basically hide them and send out tweets with clues as to where he's hidden these things. Um, uh, around the world, and he was doing this thing. He was starting this 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 event, um, a worldwide Twitter hunt. Um, he said, I, "I need some trustworthy volunteers. Send me a tweet of where you live and why I should trust you." So I thought, "Well, I've not got anything to lose, right? Apart from 140 characters, I'll send him a tweet and say, you know, I'm in London and you can trust me because I'm, you know, I'm a, a gentleman or what what have you." Um, on, hey, on cyberspace, you can be a gentleman and nobody knows, right? Um, so, um, so to my surprise, I got, uh, I got selected and he's like, okay, um, you know, we're going to send you a package um, and you know, the deal is that you'll hide it somewhere in the UK um, and you'll send us a clue as to where you've hidden it and we'll tweet that clue out. Tony will tweet that clue out to you know, all of his followers. So, um, at the, you know, at this point, I was pretty amped, as you, as you are, you know, sort of childhood 
hero and I'm, I'm pushing 40, I really should be a little bit more mature than this, but um, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was really stoked and my, my wife was actually pretty stoked as well, but for different reasons. She'd seen Tony's house on MTV Cribs and uh, thought that was a really nice house and I was just like, well, you know, Tony Hawk pro skateboarder. So a colleague of mine, uh, going by the name of Pat Udor, was like, okay, Chris, let me get this straight. You know, you work in security, you've been a security manager, some dude on Twitter who claims to be Tony Hawk is going to send you a box to an address that you gave him and you're going to hide that somewhere in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and no problems there whatsoever. <laughs> it's at that point where I was like, yeah, maybe I should look for another career actually. I'm clearly not cut out for this, you know. And uh, the other day, actually, he was saying, yeah, just think about it. You've got a whole no other angle for your talk, really. Look how easy it is if you want to get people to do something. You, you know, you don't have to pay them or anything. You just pretend to be someone, send them a box, get them to hide it somewhere. Job done. So I was a little bit uh, uh, paranoid. But uh, I was like, no, it really is Tony Hawk. He's verified by Twitter. Is anybody here from Twitter, by the way? But if you are, I'd like to buy you a really big drink. No, no one. That's a pity. Um, so uh, I went ahead with it anyway because I figured, well, you know, yeah, he's got to be real. He's on Twitter and he's got the little blue tick. So what, you know, he's got. So, so this is the box that was sent to me in, in, the, uh, in the post. So um, I sent this clue to, uh, to Tony, which um, I thought was pretty awesome, actually. Um, so, guarded by a fearsome troll, northwest from a house where you might have to pay money to pass an escape book, uh, skateboard park. So, the uh, money to pass house, the toll house, um, there's a toll house near where we live. If you go northwest, you pass a skate park and uh, where, uh, uh, where it might be guarded by a fearsome troll, but under, uh, under a bridge. Um, so I thought, oh, awesome clue, bridge. Um, it occurred to me that um, people might spot a package and think that, uh, okay, it's some sort of, somebody's, you know, from a terrorist cell is trying to blow up um, one of the most uh, important bridges in the village. Um, so um, yeah, I had some concerns about that, but I went about it uh, anyway and sent the clue out. Now, this guy here, um, is a bit of a legend actually. He'd been following Tony Hawk as well and was really more excited than I was that there was going to be this Twitter hunt in, uh, in the UK. Um, so he actually drove up in the morning uh, to uh, the, you know, sort of Basingstoke, the town where I live. Yeah, Basingstoke. Um, and he camped out basically all day waiting for Tony to send this tweet. I mean, I, I could have actually gone and taken the board to London. Um, so there, there he is um, camping out in his car. And uh, eventually, after uh, an epic quest, uh, he found it. I um, took the liberty of adding a little bit of camouflage to the package so that random dog walkers wouldn't, uh, wouldn't find it. So uh, that was his tweet there, camo, camo netting, you're a, a bad man. But um, as you can see, he was really amped to get the, uh, to get the Tony Hawk package. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what was in it. I added the, the UK flag because, um, well, I felt like it. Oh, and the, Somehow the hackersforcharity.org sticker got on there too. Um, um, Tony likes hackers. So I, obviously, with, you know, we've all established I'm on Twitter, so I've got a life. Um, I wanted to see a, a map of where all of these packages uh, went, who hid them, and who found them. Uh, uh, so I thought that would be a fairly straightforward thing to do on a nerdy Sunday afternoon. I thought, right, well... All of the people like myself who hid decks were all friends on Twitter with uh, the at hiding it account. Uh, the finders um, all were meant to tweet, I found one, uh, when they found one. So that should be easy to find, uh, you know, easy to analyze as well. And Tony uh, sends out found wherever, uh, by whoever, uh, with the hashtag uh, THTH. So there's a problem with that. Not all of the hiders were friends of uh, hiding it. Some of them were Tony Hawk's personal friends. Um, almost none of the finders actually followed the instructions. They all put the USB stick that came with the package in their computers, but none of them followed the instructions. Um, and Tony himself um, really didn't follow his own instructions either. So skateboarders, what are you going to do? 
Um, so I thought, right, I'll reach out to Twitter because I don't know about you guys, but instead of doing Google stuff now, now I ask Twitter. Um, and, uh, you know, you get a nice varied, you know, response from that. So I asked, why, does anybody know of a quick way to get information, uh, you know, out of, uh, out of Twitter? Nobody mentioned search because I should have looked at that. So see previous comment about needing to find another uh, career. Um, and I got a response from, uh, from this guy who's part of, uh, you know, turns up to the DC 4420, the DEF CON chapter meetings. And he said, uh, Maltigo can do that. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, Maltigo, what's that? So, um, you know, we had some discussion. He said, oh, it's data visualization. Go and have a look. Oh, data visualization, awesome. How did I not know about this? Brilliant. So um, I, uh, I downloaded uh, Maltigo, had a bit of a look at it. I thought, right, so here's my hypothesis, which, for the record, my hypothesis for anything, generally, you know, disregard it. Um, I figured that the hiders and the uh, people that found the skateboards would have some sort of social interaction, like, hey, congratulations, I hit the board, or, uh, you know, something like that. Uh, and I thought by finding those interactions socially, I'd be able to arrive at a Google map, and that would be a piece of cake. Um, so I started off by getting a list of the hiders in, um, in Twitter uh, with Maltigo. So I whisked through this a, a, a little bit, um, but give you some idea of what we did. So first issue that you've got um, is that you have to derive uh, what's called an entity. These things here are, 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 are entities. So you started off with a phrase. It's called a phrase. Um, and I typed in at, at hiding it, um, which you can see sort of arrowed, arrowed up there. Um, and then when you right click on that, you get a number of options that are particular to the entity that you've got. And one of them was, you know, um, searching Twitter. So um, this is what a transform looks like, a built-in transform. That means it comes with the tool. Um, you can look at all of the tweets that uh, have the phrase at hiding it in there. So uh, I did that and you get uh, a bunch of these things called uh, twit afs or Twitter uh, affiliations. They look like purple prickly things. I think now in uh, version three of the tool it's a, uh, a different logo but you get the, the idea. So these are tweets actually essentially um, and from there you can convert that to uh, 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 well, the previous one to twits actually this is how you convert uh, the, the tweet to an actual person or uh, Twitter affiliation as it's called in, in Maltigo. So you right click on that and then uh, do, do that conversion and you can select that for the whole uh, array of, of people uh, so you don't just do it you know, for one at a time, you can just select that, that whole bunch um, and eventually then you'll arrive here with, uh, you know, with um, uh, a Twitter node, a Twitter affiliation entity. Um, so that's basically how to get the, derive the, the node. It's in the, the white paper, sort of step by step, so if you want to experiment with it. The other way you can do it, which is highlighted by the, the red box in the, the corner, is sort of take one that you've already had and sort of modify it. That tends to, to work as well, um, at least for Twitter. So now you know, we, can, uh, we can get going, actually, really start and take a look at, well, who are the friends of at hiding it? So again, you've got this concept of a, of a transform, and you're looking at the friends of this person, and you can generate that, get a, a nice big list with little uh, thumbnails of uh, you know what the the people uh, look like, and then you can perform that operation, uh, you know, on all of them people again. So you can select all. There's 83 there. You have to trust me on that. You can uh, select. Uh, all 83 and run the same transform on all 83 uh, people. So I picked uh, me, that's, uh, that, that's me right there and if you see the top right hand corner there's a little red, uh, you know, red box that gives you the ability to navigate so if you've got big graphs you can navigate around the, uh, uh, around the graphs uh, using that box and then home in on it in the, uh, the, the screen in the middle. Um, so I chose, I wanted to see uh, all of the tweets that I wrote. I'm only showing you one. I could have applied that transform to every single entity 
at the same time. Um, so I did that, um, and then, uh, then that's when I noticed that things weren't happening quite as I expected. So I'd get like 12 results, but I know I'd, you know, I know I'd tweeted about, I had 50 or something tweets, so I was like, well, what's going on? This is kind of weird. Um, actually, quite a lot of exploration on why that was weird. And I thought, well, maybe it's because I'm relatively new and not that interesting. So I'll try, you know, Tony Hawk. So, uh, you know, I looked at his tweets, nothing at all. So uh, I emailed the guys in South Africa uh, who wrote the tool. By now, they must have been thinking, I wish this English guy would just go away. Um, and uh, they tried to reproduce it and have the same challenges. And digging a little bit deeper, we noticed that Twitter has got some limitations uh, in search. So it's pretty well documented um, you know, out there. What Twitter search was, the API came from uh, another uh, organization called Summarize. And it indexes, um, or maintains the index at least, uh, for about two weeks, roughly. Um, and some people aren't indexed at all, so the challenge I had was Tony Hawk wasn't indexed at all, and I was only getting the tweets that I'd written in the last two weeks. So um, a bit of a challenge there, and that is where um, this thing came in handy, because uh, Roloff, the guy who um, essentially set up Perturba from uh, SensePost, he said, uh, dude, you should try local transforms. You can write your own code. I'm thinking, <laughs> you've got the wrong guy here. I don't write code. I play around with Perl now and again. Uh, he said, but you know, if you can write, um, you know, if you can call a script or a program and you can pass it input and you can generate uh, output to standard output, then you can write a local transform, um, which, was, uh, which was pretty, pretty interesting and compelling. So I set about it. By thinking, right, well, I'll try this with, with Perl um, and have a look at the Twitter API. Now, I, I bought this book, but actually I didn't really use it that much because there's a, you know, a huge set of Twitter API uh, documentation online, uh, which you can uh, search for. But um, it's not one API, it's three APIs. So forget the search API that we mentioned from Summarize and just focus on um, the other REST uh, API, which allows you to use commands, uh, you know, call, calls like this, essentially. And this is where you'd be, uh, you know, extracting the tweets from uh, somebody. Um, and you've got a, a, an entity value there, which is uh, the person that you're looking to, uh, to grab the tweets from. Uh, if anybody wants the, you know, the code for playing around with this sort of stuff, um, I plan to just put it on, the, you know, on, the, uh, on my website, which is Security Geek, but the E's are threes. Um, so you can, you, know, you can do a lot, a lot of playing around with that. It's not all plain sailing um, either. There are some things which I wish were implemented in the Twitter API that, that aren't, like uh, searching by date and stuff like that. You kind of have to make that yourself. But Perl and LWP, uh, you know, really work uh, pretty well. So there's a couple more gotchas here as well, though. Um, you've got this 200 tweet limit. So when you, uh, you know, run the, the, the API call, you'll get 200 tweets back. So um, if you want to, like, look at uh, 400 tweets, for example, you, that's two API calls. Well, uh, that was an issue. Um, you couldn't search by date, so I couldn't say I want to get all of the tweets between these dates. I had to derive the dates by looking. Uh, each tweet has got um, an ID associated with it, and um, you can see a time. So you pull a tweet with an ID, look at the time, and um, you know, and then sort of figure out. Well, let's say there's you know, excellent. Go to another tweet ID, guess that. Say okay, well this is between two dates. That that kind of works. Um, but there's a maximum history. Um, I haven't actually tested how, uh, how rigid that is, but 3,200 tweet uh, history, and you're limited to 150 API calls uh, per hour by default. So as you can see, if you've got 100 people, which is quite easy in a graph like this because you're exploring vast sets of data, and you're running those transforms on all of those people, um, in this uh, rather small example here, you'd have 100 people, 
um, I'd be looking at making three a e API calls per person and end up with you know 300 API calls. That's already blown my uh, my limit um, with uh, with Twitter. So I'd have to do that over two hours. Uh, and that's where whitelisting comes in. You can go from 150 uh, API calls to 20,000 in an hour. Um, so you have to apply for that via, via Twitter, but uh, they were pretty good with that. Said, you know, I'm a security consultant and looking into you know, data analysis and what have you, and I'd like to be whitelisted, please. I thought that would take forever, or I'd get a no. And, uh, you know, and, and they said, yeah, sure, here, here you go, basically. Um, which then meant that I could run some pretty large graphs. So, okay, back to the, back to the story. Uh, I wanted to see who'd actually won these, uh, you know, won these skateboards. So uh, what I did, I picked out Tony Hawk, um, and then I ran the tweet, uh, the, uh, the, the transform that I'd written to pull out the tweets of people he mentioned um, here. So these are all of my local transforms, get tweet one, two and three, and they'd search between certain uh, IDs uh, and pull out all of the tweets that had uh, either the, the uh, word found in there or had, um, you know, an at mention. So Twitter usernames are at username, um, so you can pull them out with a regular expression really easily. Um, and basically I'd display those and discard everything else that he'd written. So I wasn't particularly interested in what he'd had for breakfast, but I was interested in if he was, you know, corresponding with someone through Twitter. So um, this is what it, what it ends up looking like. So, for example, one of those, that one on the top left-hand corner there, was uh, found uh, Atlanta, uh, you know, uh, uh, blah, 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 basically. Um, and that would have been a similar story for each of those. So potentially in that set of data uh, are the people who won these skateboards. Um, as you go a little bit further uh, and run the, you know, run more of those transforms on a, a wider and wider data set, then you can start to see uh, relationships building between these people who's spoken to who. In this case, you'll see Tony's talked to a few people, and those people have also been people that were hiding stuff. So there's some relationship, obviously, there. And as you go further, then uh, you know the map gets a little bit more complex. If you, you know, if you're looking at it uh, closely. Top right-hand corner to navigate again is a, a you know a great way of tackling that, and you end up with uh, one of these, um, which is a a big graph. Um, I decided I'd have a bit of a go um, at running more and more uh, transforms, uh, so I set off a you know a, a transform on a big data set and went out running about halfway uh, around like a six mile loop, it occurred to me that this was all happening on some servers in South Africa and they might be getting a little bit pissed off. Um, so I ran back home pretty quickly and saw this. Um, and uh, you can't do a lot with, uh, with a map like that, really. Um, so what you need to do is prune that, basically, and you can look for, uh, you can look for entities that don't correspond with anybody else and just cut them out. So Pruning your data set um, is a you know, sort of big activity in, uh, in Multigo, but you can get that then down and you can get a, a pretty nice graph. And here you can see you've got at hiding it is the, the dot at the top uh, left-hand corner. You've got Tony Hawk, you've got somebody following at hiding it, you've got somebody who Tony's mentioned, and you've got some cor you know, correspondence between those two. So there's something going on there and you can explore them and just end up with a data set of people who've been communicating uh, there's another view uh, here that you'll see in, uh, in Multigo, and uh, just to highlight where the lines are there, you can see pretty much the same sort of thing again. If you're looking at, or I guess, you, you know, um, right now you might be thinking, well, how does this speed things up? Well, you apply edge weighting, then you can see essentially who are the, uh, who are the top talkers um, in that uh, Twitter uh, event, and here you'll see Tony Hawk hiding it in Jerome Case. Um, but, you know, what on earth have I been going on about? Well, if you look, at, look here, then you'll see that there's me and there's this other guy, Stephen Gill, and there's Jerome Case. Well, Jerome Case, you might be scratching your head thinking, well, who's Jerome Case? Well, um, I didn't even know he had, uh, you know, a, a Twitter account 
And this guy was the guy that sent me the, the skateboard, Tony Hawk's sort of right-hand man dude. Uh, he's got a, a Twitter account, he's, he, he's tweeting, and, um, and you know, before I used this, uh, this graph, I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, it hadn't occurred to me to look. So if you're analyzing an event, you can see perhaps who are the most interesting people at the event. So you could apply that here to, you know, to Black Hat, for example, or to, to DEF CON or what have you, and see maybe where the big buzz was without actually having to attend. So um, you, know, you don't need to be limited to, uh, uh, to Twitter. You can just search uh, you know, websites for, for names, for example. So uh, this is what the guys uh, look like. I'll put that in. Um, so lessons learned, I've got three lessons learned. Um, the first one, which uh, the Perturva guys really uh, instilled, was plan what you're, what you're doing, um, have an idea about how you're going to go about it before you go about it, otherwise you can generate a lot of, uh, a lot of mess. Um, the next thing, if you're using Multigo, is um, if you've got this, this setting here uh, for speed and accuracy, if that bar is over to the left, you get less results, so it's good for uh, testing out your transforms. Um, and when you've got that working and you're happy with it, slide it across to the right. And if you're ever thinking, I'm not getting many results, what's going on, then um, it's probably because you've got that bar slid over to the, to the left. Um, and the third, uh, third sort of slide of lessons learned is that these local transforms, you can apply these to a, a great deal more than Twitter. Right, um, you know, you can apply them in any context. Uh, the guys at uh, Perturva there have even analysed like a Spider-Man movie, who's talking to who and what the relationships are there. Um, if you're in an enterprise and you want to use this perhaps for you know vulnerability testing, pen testing, what have you, consider the server platform. So you're running transforms in your own enterprise. Um, and if you're going to uh, explore Twitter, then I'd seriously recommend taking a look at uh, applying for whitelisting. So did it help me get um, a map? Uh, so, sort of, um, but uh, not really. Uh, my wife was expecting our, our first child, um, so um, what we ended up doing was we, you know, we went to the hospital waiting for the chap to, uh, to arrive, took a bunch of printouts and stuff like that and uh, did it all by hand in the end because uh, I totally failed and, uh, and ran out of time. But uh, you could see some of the relationships, but. Uh, this, uh, this was what we ended up doing in the end, so uh, I just wanted to, to come, come clean with that. But I don't know how many of you have seen this, because this is a, a similar concept, but using processing by uh, a guy called Jer Thorpe. Um, if you've not seen this, go Google around for Just Landed. The concept here was that people on Twitter you know, were saying, oh, you know, uh, I just landed in Las Vegas, wheels down Las Vegas, you know, made it to Las Vegas or what have you. Um, so what he did, he analyzed uh, he got the Twitter profile of where they are, identified the location, used something called MetaCarta, which pulls out the, uh, the location and gives you a geographical grid reference, or, you know, um, and looked at where they landed and where they said they landed, where the, you know, sort of where, the, where the name was, passed that through MetaCarta and got a grid reference, mapped that in, uh, in processing and generated this pretty neat uh, visual of where people were going and flying to within a, within a data set. So um, I talked about Multigo, but you know you can apply this with different tools. Um, also with uh, with Twitter, I, you know, used the uh, the API stuff, and I'll share this. Um, this isn't Digital Equipment Corporation; it's a disasters emergency uh, charity in the in the UK, and they were looking at analysing their social media. Um, activity for uh, the Haiti disaster. And they wanted to see how many tweets they were making, how many of those tweets were being retweeted and stuff like that. So with those same API calls, I was able to apply that and generate, uh, you know, generate these graphs. But if you're looking at that in a sort of more professional way, check out Rowfeeder uh, by a guy called uh, Damon Cortesi. It's a really sweet product. Um, so on to... Um, on to another use case, really, um, probably focus a little bit more on the Nigerian crime aspect here rather than, uh, rather than multi, Multigo uh, just. But uh, this guy's pretty famous in, um, in Nigeria. He's wrote a song basically about 419 scamming uh, called I Go Chop Your Dollar. Um, 
and uh, he, he's pretty popular. So I got involved with this because a friend um, lost a, a laptop to uh, a scam on a, a certain uh, auction site and uh, wanted to, well, you know, work with the police and try and, you know, get the laptop back, basically. Well, um, I don't know how it is in the, in the US, but in the UK, the police are quite disjointed in their approach to this sort of thing. Um, so depending on who you call first, your uh, crime log can get held up. So if you ever send anything to a legitimate address, better to try and call the police in that jurisdiction rather than your local one. Um, i explain a little bit more. So quick disclaimer, some of the names, dates, images and stuff have been changed to, um, so, well basically so, so I don't get bumped off on the way home. Um, so this is my friend who, who lost, her, um, lost her laptop. She put it on an auction site. This actually sequence of events is pretty, pretty common for, for scammers right now, but I'm sure they'll move and migrate, get a little bit, bit better. It got bought quickly at uh, the buy now price. So um, that's sort of maybe a telltale giveaway that you're about to get scammed. Um, she exchanged emails with, uh, with the buyer um, and it seemed okay at least. The, she had checked, she had actually gone to check that the address she was sending it to was a valid address and it was. Um, so she was you know, a little bit skeptical. Um, and then she got a notification from PayPal except it wasn't from PayPal uh, at all. Um, and then she got uh, a notification from, uh, she sent the laptop to a valid address and then she got notification that the um, account that she had been dealing with at the auction site had been compromised. Um, you know, so it was then that it dawned on her that, you know, she had just sent this like expensive package to a, a valid address and began panicking a little bit and um, you know contacted the police um, and because she knew I worked in security and uh, had a relationship with with the police locally um, she asked if there's anything I could do to point her in the right direction or point the police in the right direction to people that could help so another hypothesis is I thought well if you've got the um, if you've got the scammer dude and you've got the address that they sent the package to, then should be possible to get reacquainted with the laptop and um, hopefully uh, ensure that justice is, uh, is done. Um, notice that there's no cake there. So first of all, where is our uh, scammer? So my initial thought was, well, the first thing I want to do is, um, is you know, get the IP address and see if they're based in the UK or something like that. Um, so uh, the trouble was, uh, scammer uses, you know, web-based mail, so uh, getting headers was uh, uh, somewhat of a, a challenge. Um, but I figured that this might be a reasonable approach. So you can sign up for a free blog site with, um, with logs and post a, an image up there, um, let's say. Then you can um, send the spammer an email. It's a rather compelling email. Um, like, hey, I've got this other laptop, do you want to check this out? Um, and embed that in the, uh, in the email. They click on the email and essentially um, after some time you'll get the, uh, you'll get the uh, IP address from, uh, from which it, it came. Um, now, you might also want to go and see Jeremiah Grossman's talk because I think he's talking about some browser exploits um, that you can uh, you can use that'll pull out data from um, you know from the sort of the auto populate form uh, thing. I go see his talk. I've not seen it, but uh, that's what I'm reading. That'll give you things like first name, last name, all sorts of interesting stuff. So um, we got the IP address, but if you see what he's doing, maybe there's there's more you can do. Um, and unsurprisingly, the IP address turned out to be uh, in this place, Lagos in in Nigeria. Um, so it's like, yeah, okay, there's definitely, it's, uh, it's gone to a legitimate address in the UK, but whoever the scammer is, is either routing his traffic through Lagos or is there, and I figured that it probably actually is there. So we had um, NS is the Nigerian scammer, 
Um, he also likes uh, uh, American comedians, and uh, he was going by the alias of Larry the Cable Guy or something like that. Um, had a, a, an email address, and then we knew that the package had gone to somebody called Alice, who's based in a town in the UK called Newcastle. Um, I don't know in the US if you've got a site like this, but 192.com enables you to put in names of people and it will give you the addresses that they not only live at, but the previous addresses they've lived at and a whole bunch more other information. So I thought we'll put the name of that person in, it will show that they live at that address, you know, and who else they live with and, you know, so job done. Uh, but it didn't work because um, the person who was at that address had probably been, been uh, you know, been renting so you didn't get the you know didn't get the real name so that that approach initial approach failed then uh, figured well uh, just some information gathering on google see where these people have got uh, you know profiles so bebo myspace um, and of course uh, facebook a whole bunch of stuff out there um, so you know there i thought well maybe have an explore with uh, with multigo um, so this guy here, uh, Dominic White, uh, or at Singe on uh, Twitter, has wrote some really useful Facebook transforms for Multigo. Uh, Facebook have got it in their terms of services, you know, not to do this. So I want to be, you know, clear about that. But he, he's got some, um, and they're published out there. Um, written in Python using mechanized and beautiful soup to you know interact with uh, with Facebook um, so I figured okay let's uh, let's take a look at that and we've got three results back for Alice actually we got a whole lot more results back for Alice but you don't need to to see that because the the purpose is really just to show you the approach we took so um, but which one is the real uh, real Alice well did a transform of Facebook to Facebook friends and saw, you know, that she had a, a number of friends, they all had a number of friends, and then it was like, yeah, but which one's a real one? Let's take a look at uh, the location of those people. So I ran a, um, a cobbled together transform which identified the, the location based on their Facebook profile as being, uh, here you'll see that she had um, a lot of friends in Lagos and a lot of friends in Newcastle. So it was a good chance that that was going to be the person out of all of the Alice's that we were, you know, we were looking for. Um, so um, an awful lot of stuff in the public uh, profile as well. So you could actually get quite a lot of information. And it certainly looked like this was our man, well, our, our lady. Um, so at this point, I mentioned that, you know, um, Facebook terms of service uh, do read them. There's this guy here, um, Pete Warden, who's done. I don't know if how many people are familiar, but um, this blew my mind actually. Um, he built his own sort of Facebook profile search engine, um, which was uh, used a uh, hundred machine cluster running Hadoop for about ten dollars uh, an hour, um, and he crawled Facebook. This was, I think, maybe a year and a bit ago, something like that and uh, ended up obtaining 220 million profiles uh, from, uh, from Facebook in about 10 hours. It cost him about $100. So the ability to crawl and obtain vast data sets is, um, is, has never really been, uh, been easier. Um, but he ran into a lot of legal trouble with, uh, with Facebook and uh, they're pretty clear. So really the talk is aimed at sharing this, um, particular with, particularly with folks in law enforcement who'd be able to you know, approach p Facebook legitimately to do these kinds of searches. So don't go and do this without asking them nicely unless you want to get on the wrong end of Facebook who I think are a little bit more um, a little bit more surly than Nigerian scammers even in terms of following up. So yeah, he got 220 million, um, which boggled my mind really. He did all sorts of analysis with it. Check out Pete Warden's website um, and you can see some of, the, some of the stuff he's done there. Amazing. Um, so, okay, so uh, information available to all. So if folks have got, well, you know, you guys probably know this, their privacy set to everybody, then bingo, you're, you're in. You can crawl pretty much anything fascinating and lots of people do that um, if not you can only do so much without being a friend sort of um, 
So how do we get to the, uh, the good stuff in people's profiles? Well, um, there's a couple of ways you can approach this. So the social zombies talk that's been at DEF CON, ShmooCon uh, and whatnot, you can create uh, bad applications, Facebook applications, and get people to use them. And then you can use uh, Facebook query language pretty well to you know, obtain this data. So there's at least two talks uh, on the social zombies topic. Um, you know, go and check them out for ideas. Um, or you could uh, make friends with people and then uh, adopt uh, Singer's approach with um, Python and, uh, and Mechanize. And for that one, see Satan is on your, your friends list. And actually, there's a talk later this afternoon, I think by Tom Ryan, uh, might give some good ideas uh, you know, uh, as well. Or um, you can follow this guy on Twitter. He's got a website as well, the Harmony Guy. Um, you know, he's identified a you know, number of flaws over the last year and worked uh, you know, with Facebook. But if you're smart, there's, you know, there's probably other ways you can you know, approach it. So I opted for uh, an easy approach of sort of just making some new friends, really. Um, so the idea here is that you'd create um, a, a credible account. Um, and again, take a look at the, the talk a bit later on tonight um, for maybe more about how you're doing that. And then build up your identity uh, slowly, so you've got you know something credible, some interactions on your wall, photos and stuff like that. Um, don't go directly for your target because they'll be like, "Huh, somebody's trying to friend me who's got nothing on their you know sort of Facebook profile, and they've got no friends." So uh, the approach is really join sort of uh, uh, groups, universities, schools, similar to uh, ones that your target has got, uh, friends of friends, and uh, then finally home in on on your target. Um, if they've got over a thousand friends and a lot of people have, then basically they're easy um, and they'll friend anyone. So they're great targets. I also found that demographically, at least between the UK and Nigeria, um, Nigerians at least that I made friends with were uh, a lot more eager to become friends than people in the UK. Uh, and take your time. So uh, I think the talk tonight will show how this was done over like 28 days. I didn't have 28 days, so um, and I wasn't really that bothered about being noisy or not. So um, I basically went through all that in about two hours. Um, and it still worked, much to my surprise. Um, so um, if you're impatient like me, it can, can work. So uh, you can automate this as well. If you've seen the tool um, iMacros by iOpus, it was in Michael Schrenk's talk last year. Uh, go and have a look at it. It's brilliant. Um, but you need to be careful on how quickly you're adding friends and stuff like that, especially like on Twitter, because if you see something adding friends at a rapid rate of knots, then you'll get your account suspended and you have to wait for ages and then you'll have no friends when you get back and stuff like that. Um, so, so, okay, making friends uh, you know, with people on, on Facebook. So this was, uh, this was one of the responses I, I got, uh, at which point I thought, um, I've been busted, <laughs> basically. Um, so I said, oh, I'm a friend of Alice's, um, just getting started with Facebook, because I didn't have a lot on there. Um, I might have added a few too many people or something, sorry. Um, and, uh, and that was it, basically. Um, yeah, well, you know, Alice is my best friend, so yeah, we're cool, um, brilliant. Um, so, you know, that was pretty much how it went. Only a few people ever came back and said, hey, do I actually know you? And, you know, usually, yeah, <laughs> that worked uh, most of the time. Um, or you could see parties that they'd been to on their Facebook profiles and whatnot. So, yeah, I was at this party, but I was a little bit drunk, so I might have got your name wrong. Um, so this was how I went about getting a map of uh, interesting peoples. Um, get uh, the friends in, uh, you know, this is essentially the pseudo code for you know, running, your, uh, running your sort of Maltigo uh, approach. Get the location. If the location is sort of uh, Nigeria, Lagos, and a bunch of other Nigerian places, then uh, scrape or pass the, the wall posts, uh, download them, uh, download photos. If the wall posts contain interesting phrases, and you, you, know, you get to see a lot of those, um, then download uh, those, and if they're if they you know, basically tick any of those flags, then uh, pipe them back into to Maltigo and add them to the, to the map. 
So like we did with the Tony Hawk thing where we just wanted the tweets where he'd said, you know, at in his name, um, we just wanted the interesting people back from, uh, from Maltigo that may have had something to do with uh, being a Nigerian scammer. So, um, you know, this is essentially what it looks like, get friends of people, um, you'll see a, a big map start to emerge, you do that multiple times, you end up with something a little bit more like this. Um, the bigger dots are more interesting, so you do a bit of pruning that we mentioned, the small bots at the bottom are the UK people, and you end up with a, a relationship that looks a little bit more like this, so the big dots are the major players. Uh, they're all interconnected around the, the edge and connected between themselves and then they've got people that they connect to in the middle. So uh, the idea here is that you can then start drilling down on these people and exploring further. So you'd get interesting Facebook updates like 7K in five days, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, and uh, looking through the profiles, it's, it's easy to see that these guys are, you know, living, uh, living a high life uh, out there in, uh, in Nigeria. And uh, who can blame them with fast money and fast chicks and stuff like that? Um, they had uh, lots of photos, a little bit like this one. Um, that's not actually a PS3, but you know you get the idea on their wall posts and what have you. And uh, they're very keen on sharing their, you know, their wins. Let's say uh, lots of pictures of Western Union celebrating with uh, with champagne and what have you. Uh, more screenshots of stuff on Western Union seems to be popular with Nigerians, uh, Nigerian scammers, I should say, because you know um, that wouldn't be fair on the rest. So it's compelling. Why do they do it? Um, you can see that they can make an awful lot of money here, seven hundred to six thousand um, dollars. This was a Facebook profile as well, um, a wall post. Yeah, let's go scam more people. These guys are communicating on Facebook very openly. Um, and uh, you know, communicating with, with, with each other. Uh, so how about something a little bit more dodgy? Well, there were, there were pictures a little bit like this, although not like this, because if you Google you know, a duffel bag with money, then you'll see where I got the image from. But there were similar images, let's say. Um, some of the images might have looked a little bit more like this. Um, so you know, they, they got all of this money. It's all publicly available. You can go and check that out quite, quite easily. Um, on, uh, on their Facebook profiles, more, uh, more wealth. Um, so then things got a little bit more dodgy and that's when I thought, well, actually, maybe I'll stop digging around and just leave this up to the professionals. Uh, they had, uh, they had uh, pictures of guns, not this gun, but they had pictures of guns with the people who were in their you know, sort of Facebook profiles so you could see names and faces, stuff like that. I was like, oh, that looks a bit serious. So obvious question in my mind was, well, are there links with terror? So I did some digging around, and if you're interested in Nigerian crime, um, a really interesting company, an UltraScan Advanced Global International based out of Amsterdam, uh, they do a lot of research into this sort of thing, got a lot of data on it, and uh, they've got a 2009 report about scamming. Uh, go and check it out, but they did actually uh, identify direct relationships between um, 419 advanced fee frauds and uh, you know and uh, and terror before there was only indirect sort of slipstream uh, money and now there's you know direct links so okay the true identity of our scammer um, let's say uh, I was to set up an email address that was similar to the uh, the person who obtained the laptop in the UK send out a note saying hey you know this is um, this is Alice this is my new email address um, would you believe it? Uh, Facebook's acting weird. Can you just send me a wall post? Because um, I figured that, you know, with all of the people that she was friends with, um, there'd be, uh, one of them would be our, our man, um, Larry the Cable Guy. So to my great surprise, he's like, yeah, sure. So I uh, sent a message back saying, thanks, hot stuff. Um, why not? <laughs> um, and he then said, as a bonus, say hi to, you know, XXXXX. I said, oh, bonus, because I've seen pictures of Alice with XXXXX. Um, I didn't know they were together. The conversation continued a little bit more, and it seemed like he does more of the dealing with XXS than, uh, you know, than, uh, than, uh, than with this uh, Alice. So that was a bonus, really. Um, so got a Facebook update like this, um, which was... Um, very similar to this, but you know, but not this. I was uh, amazed. I was like, "Why not? That worked." <laughs> it 
Brilliant. Uh, so now we've got some more connections. You've got a connection now between Alice and the scammer in Nigeria, which we didn't have before. So this was, of course, interesting to the police who, you know, had anecdotal uh, evidence or uh, had an idea that this was happening, but didn't have anything to actually tie it all, you know, together. So um, then they had this link with this uh, UK uh, scammer who was also, you know, uh, closely related to Alice. And uh, so what that actually happened is you've got, um, well, let me show you on the next uh, slide, really. Uh, you've got scammer networks, so organized slightly. Um, you've got 62 scammer networks in the UK alone, according to the UltraScan International um, uh, 419 report. Um, and what they have is essentially a bunch of like cells in different countries um, who will then work with local people and uh, use them as places where they, you know, sort of ship their, their goods to valid addresses and they'll just, you know, use this people and then burn them out and get more people. That's kind of how it works. Spain's got the highest number of uh, scammer networks with 72 and the USA are trailing with 53, but don't feel bad about that, folks from the USA, because you've got more than double the amount of people than anybody else. You've got about 2,300 uh, people make up those 53 sort of uh, crime cells. So places with lots of Nigerian uh, university societies, things like that, probably uh, great places for targeting people. You've got 916 of these around the world, 16,000 members, and they're raking about $9.3 billion in 2009, so it's big business. People are falling for it all the time, and there's uh, all sorts of different scams. Romance scams, um, people fall for that a lot, uh, cars, that kind of thing. So, okay, so you've got the scammer, you've got the person that this went to uh, in the UK, you've got a whole bunch of information. The police can't really do anything because they've got stuff that they, you know, they're seeing on Facebook and difficult to prosecute and not so interested in, you know, the people at the end. Um, so how do you get your money back, basically? Well, um, what you could do, I suppose, um, hypothetically, is you could pile all of the information that you've found and put it in a blog post. Um, and also create maybe a Facebook fan site and encourage all of their friends to, to join. Um, and I mentioned that, uh, you know, email the, the scammers and say, hey, you know, just to let you know, I set this up and, you know, in a couple of days' time or something, Google will have indexed this and you'll never get rid of it very easily. You could do that, right, hypothetically. Um, and then you could follow up with a call. I don't know about the US, but in the UK, you can just buy SIM cards with cash um, and agree some amicable terms, you know. Um, that could work. Um, so, okay, yeah, we want to give you some money back. Uh, it's been a little misunderstanding that's, uh, you know, how do you get the scammers' dollars into to your bank? Well, cash obviously is going to be tricky because where are you going to exchange the cash? Oh, yeah, meet me here. Yeah, just be me and don't bring anybody else, especially not those people with guns because they kind of scare me. Uh, and then bank. Well, what do you do with the bank? Give them your bank account details. Uh, not so smart probably. PayPal, um, again, that would be linked to an individual, not a great idea. Western Union, you're going to have to give them a name or a fake ID or something, not a great idea. Um, probably the only one on that list that would make any sense if you were to do it, which I must stress I didn't, uh, would be Amazon gift certificates because you can get them then emailed to like just an email address. Nobody's any the wiser job done. You, you know, you're limited to, what is it, $500 or something like that. Um, that would probably be the only way you'd go to a scammer and say, actually, uh, here's how I'd like my money back. Or you could say, just go to the police and hand back the laptop. We don't have the laptop. So, um, health warnings. Um, yeah, uh, I wouldn't recommend do it or completely, uh, you know, anonymize this. Uh, if you are going to do it, uh, you're limited to, generally, to public information. Um, read the terms of service because they Facebook are very tight on that a wealth of information but they're very tight so really law enforcement or if you're you know in a corporation go through legitimate channels um, uh, you know sort of uh, friend up with your own account at your own risk um, you'd need to be nuts to do that really um, but then setting up a second account would also be a violation of terms of service, so you perhaps wouldn't want to do that either. So maybe you could convince another friend who just happens to, you know, live in the same house as you of a different name to, 
do that. Um, work with law enforcement, keep on the right side of you know, where things are at. And um, if you wanted to do any of that, you'd have to break terms of service. So, uh, you know. so wrapping up the talk, um, mining data has got more uh, accessible than uh, ever before. Uh, visualization can help you home in. That's the key point, really, because you might be sitting here thinking, well, I can do all this stuff anyway, but it's going to help you home in on interesting relationships. And finally, uh, things like you know, getting the metadata or named entity recognition, that can help you really classify information. A uh, combination of those three is going to speed things up. So, like I say, it took me a couple of hours to get a bunch of friends, took a couple of hours to you know, pull down a bunch of information, see where the interesting pictures were, you know, go back, dive down into those link, you know, keep building it up the, uh, the network. Um, following these people, this is all on the, uh, you know, the, uh, on the CD, and I'll put it on the website as well. If you're into Multigo, Perturba, obviously, Singe, Mubix, and Carnal Ownage, these guys are, uh, are pretty into Multigo. Social network folks, Tom Easton, he's not here, uh, Digi Ninja, uh, they, those guys did the Social Zombies. Uh, the Harmony guy I mentioned, with, uh, he did like a month of Facebook vulnerabilities last year, and uh, social media security, those are great people to, to follow and to, you know, to check out. And then uh, data mining, visualization, you've got Damien Cortese, he's the guy that does row feeder um, and what have you. You've got Neil Codner, I don't know if anybody um, has ever used Twitter and put in uh, anything that's mentioned Full Metal Jacket. Well, if you do that, then you get the, the drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket coming back at you with some aggressive language and, you know, made me laugh actually out loud. And he's the guy behind that and does a bunch of other data mining stuff. And then Pete Ward and the guy who, you know, nearly got, um, nearly got served by uh, Facebook and escaped that by the skin of his teeth. Some great stuff there. So uh, that's uh, about all I've got to say about that, except that uh, I've got a signed Tony Hawk skateboard uh, here and I uh, don't want to take it home. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know, how should I do this really, you know, I mean, uh, hands up who's on Twitter here or has got the ability to get on Twitter, I mean. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should I give it him for asking nicely? What do you think? Yeah, what the hell? Yeah, what the hell? What, what was that? Uh, show hands to who says, yeah, give it him. Yeah, yeah, That's like three. I'll hide it somewhere. You'll have to follow me um, at the <laughs> at the Sugmeister on uh, on Twitter. Um, yeah, I'll hide it somewhere. It's going today. I'll tweet it out at some point in the next couple of hours and uh, have at it, people. Thanks. And uh, any questions? <laughs>